So yes, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. I think this new conference is a fantastic uh, initiative. Well done those who set it up. Um, and I, uh, I, I wanted to support it, and I wanted to write a paper for it, partly as an excuse because I wanted to come and, uh, and, and enjoy it, just participate. So I, mean, I particularly was struck in the uh, call for papers by, um, by the, uh, the, the need for papers on it to get the uh, wording right. And, uh, the art, act and experience of programming, particularly uh, the, the art of programming and um, the call for programming pearls. I think um, uh, programming pearls are dear to my heart. This is something that uh, I've been involved with in the functional programming community, uh, but deriving from John Bentley's uh, very influential column in CACM. I think that was, uh, that was a joy to read, um, and we should do more of this. So, so, uh, Props to programming. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, lenses, data accessors. Um, so think of uh, the getters and setters uh, for the fields of a record. Uh, in, in a certain community, those things are called lenses. They give you access to uh, an aspect of a more of a composite data structure. So to one of the fields of a record. Um, you, might, you can see a record as a product type, um, and there's a, there's a dual um, in a very formal, precise sense of those um, product types as sum types, variant types, and there's an, uh, an analog of lenses for those that give you data accesses onto things in a, in a sum type. They've been called prisms, and uh, lenses and prisms together have been called optics. So the, the, that's, that explains the optics in the title of the paper. Their, their data axis on the composite structure. Uh, as well as lenses and prisms, there are some other variants that I, I'll show you very briefly. Uh, adapters, which basically just do data conversion. They don't throw any of the data away. And traversals, which iterate over, uh, over container types. So they also fit the pattern. So the these things work quite well, but there's a problem with them. They're not, they're not modular. They don't compose nicely. Uh, so in particular, if I have a, um, a data structure that involves products and sums, uh, you might hope to gain access to it by putting together uh, lenses to get to the product part of it and prisms to get to the sum part of it. <coughs> but with the obvious representation of lenses and prisms, uh, you can't even express that composition, the, 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 the composite thing is, is not within the universe of expression. And I'll show you that. Even when uh, you want to compose two things of the same kind, so two lenses to give you access to a nested uh, item in a composite structure, you can do that, it is expressible, but it's only clunkily expressible. It doesn't compose nicely. Um, so I'm going to show you an alternative representation in terms of these things called profunctors, and I'll explain what those are. Um, uh, which will solve problems. It will, it will give you a convenient homogeneous composition and it will allow you in the first place to do heterogeneous composition of these data accesses, these objects. Um, one of the communities that's studying these lenses is the, is the bidirectional transformations community and you can see these as a simple way of um, uh, representing bidirectional transformations. This is data conversions that keep data of, in multiple formats in sync and multiple overlapping but uh, with no data source necessarily being an authoritative one. So for example, when you're doing model driven development and you have one composite model and you have different views on that model and you'd like to be able to interact independently with the view. Uh, that's a primary concern of the bidirectional transformations community and lenses is something that they study very carefully. Um, so I used to use this, uh, this diagram, but I've, I've become enamored of the, uh, the old British Rail uh, logo, which is an entity t-shirt. Um, <laughs> so the, these, are, these are lenses. Now I think here, this is not a, a record, but a very simple um, composite data type, just a pair, a, a product data type. Um, so I suppose you have a, um, an AC pair. There is an A in there. And if you want to act on the A, uh, you need to get the A out of the pair, do something to it, and put it back in the pair again. You need to get it from the pair, do something to it, and set that thing back in the pair. Now those two functions are called view and update. 
So if my pair is a type S, um, I can uh, get the A, get the view, with my view function, um, and then I can turn it into a B and stick it back, and I'll get a, a new convolute structure T out of it. <coughs> so I express that here in a, a record in Haskell. This is this lens record type has two fields called view and update, and they're both they're both functions. So a, a, a lens in this Haskell data type is, a, is just a pair of functions: the, the view function and the update function. Um, and the picture at the bottom right is supposed to illustrate this. Uh, from the S, you can extract an A, um, and then if you turn that A into a B, you can put it back together with the original S, because there's some other stuff in the pair that you don't currently have hold of. Uh, you need to set the new B into the old S to get a T. So there's an arrow there, the curved arrow um, takes the S and the B and makes the T. That's the update function. So I've given a... Um, an example of uh, one of these lenses. This is the lens onto the left-hand component of the pair. So if I have an AC pair, I can view uh, to get the A out. That's my view first function. And if I turn the A, if I turn that X into a Y, uh, sorry, if I turn that X into an X prime, I can set it into the pair and it overwrites the left-hand component of the pair. So that's my update first function. So that's the. Uh, the familiar ones, the lenses, the, um, the, the dual prisms are a bit less familiar, but they are precisely dual. Um, think now of a variant data type. Um, you might uh, rather, uh, in a simple way, just think of a, an optional data structure. So in Haskell, that's represented with the maybe type. So maybe A is optionally an A. And there is sort of morally, sometimes, an A in there, and you'd like to be able to act on that A. So what you do is you downcast from this variant type to one of its variants. And you downcast from the maybe A to an A, then you can act on the A and turn it into a B, and then you can upcast uh, that B back to the variant type again. Um, so here, uh, look at the picture at the bottom right, uh, it's actually a very similar picture, uh, but very slightly different. Um, the, the curved arrow is in a slightly different place. Um, uh, that's rather subtle, so let me expand on that. Upcasting is easy. Um, given a B, I can always make a, an optional B. That's, uh, that's just, that always works. It's the downcasting here that's the tricky bit. So the thing that's called match. Um, when you try to match, you might succeed and get an A out, or you, you might fail and immediately head to the exit. So here, this is a, um, the, the value I've given there, the, the, the value called the, gives you access onto the uh, element of an optional type. So if I have an ABA, I can uh, sometimes get an A out of it, and if I turn that A into B, I can uh, turn it back into a, an ABB. And without dwelling on the definitions of, of, the, of the Haskell, I hope, I hope the, the, the picture gives you the idea of what's going on there. There is a, an optional A, and you know what to do with A's. You'd like to be able to act on that A uh, in place. Uh, that's the data access onto a, a certain <coughs> type. Um, briefly, here are the, the two variations. Um, these adapters, they're just data conversions. So um, maybe you've got something that works on uh, nested pairs, A comma, B comma, C pairs, and you have a thing that is a, an ABC triple. It uh, just needs to it just needs some, some adapting to make it into the right format. You need to turn your triple into a, uh, a nested pair. So you, you might have a data conversion that converts from triples to nested pairs, and you can act on the nested pairs, and then you can convert the nested pairs back to triples again. So that's, that's like a lens, except when you set it overwrites the whole thing. When you when you update with the lens, you don't need the old structure anymore because you're going to overwrite the whole thing. So it's a it's a lens in which the view is uh, has all the information in. Um, so it's like the lens picture, but with with one of the bits of dashed arrows missing. It's also like a prism, um, uh, but the it's a variant type with only one variant, so the matching always succeeds. There's no way it can fail. So again, one of the dashed bits of lines is, is missing in the picture. 
Um, traversals, uh, you'll have to read the paper to get the, the full story, because I don't have time to explain all that. But uh, think of a, a tree of A's that has A's in it. Uh, and if you can act on the A's and uh, turn them into B's, uh, you might want to act on a tree of A's and turn it into a tree of B's. And it, it actually fits the same pattern. It's not immediately obvious that it does, but you can, when, when S is a tree of A's, you can get some A's out of it. That's the, uh, the thing that gives you an n tuple of A's. Uh, and then if you turn the n tuple of A's into an n tuple of B's for the same n, you can put those back in the tree again. So it's the, it's the same kind of picture. And uh, if you read the paper, you'll see that it's precisely the same kind of uh, algebra that's going on in there. So lenses and prisms and adapters and traversals, they're all various kinds of, uh, of optic. And here's, here's the problem. <coughs> um, let me show you the, uh, just the, the awkwardness problem first. You, you know how to get to the left-hand component of the pair. Well, I showed you that was, uh, that was pi 1. It's access on the left-hand component of the pair. Now, suppose I have a nested pair, an ACB nested pair. Uh, I should be able to get on the left-hand component of that. That's the AC part. And then the left-hand component of that. That's the A part. And then I should be able to turn that A into a B and then put it back and begin to make a nest of pair again. Um, and you can. Um, so I11 one, one, gives you the access onto the left part of the left part of the nested pair here. Given a, an ACD nested pair, you can get an A out, you can turn it into a B, and then you can stick it back in and make a BCD nested pair. You can do it, but it's rather rather funky to do it. The, the getter parts, the view functions, compose nicely. They're just functions. So you can get the left part and then get the left part of that. That's just function composition. That's the, um, the, the V composed V uh, on this line. But if you think about it, the, the setter part, the update function, is more complicated because uh, you, you have to get the middle bit in order to set into it. So, so the composing the update functions, the setters, involves getters as well. And so it's a, it's a rather long-winded piece of fast I don't think I can write this any, uh, uh, any more simply, certainly not without um, introducing a whole bunch more stuff to explain to you. That's the, the best I can do. Um, well, in fact, I could do better if I just ignore this stuff about lenses altogether. Um, it's, it's obvious how to set the left-hand component of the left-hand component of the pair using pattern matching. You pattern match against the nested pair and just overwrite one of those, uh, one of those variables in the pattern. So, um, there's a better way of writing the update that just dispenses with all this lens nonsense in the first place. Um, so this abstraction is obviously an inconvenient thing. If, you, if, if you're tempted to step around it because you can't write a short program uh, uh, and you could write a short program without it, then the, the abstraction is getting in the way. It's the wrong abstraction. So that's one of the, the problems. And the other one, is, um, is more serious because there are things that you'd like to do that you can't do at all, never mind not being able to do them conveniently. <coughs> so consider here an optional AB pair. Um, it has an A in it sometimes, and you'd like to be able to act on that A. Uh, but, um, and, and moreover, you'd like to be able to uh, express how to act on that A in an optional AB pair, by putting together what you know how to act on the left-hand components of pairs and how to act on optional values. Um, but you can't express it. It's not on lens because there's no view function. A view function would take the maybe A cross B and produce an A. And if there's a if that optional value really does have an A B pair in it, sure you can get an A. But if it doesn't, you're stuck. Uh, if you if you have no information, there's no way you can get the A. No. So there's no view function to fulfill the promise. Uh, of, of the lens interface. And dually, there's no build function. There's no way of fulfilling the promise in the prism interface either. The, uh, the build function would upcast an A to an optional AB pair, and the optional part is okay, but you need to get a B from somewhere. And uh, if all you have is an A, then you can't. So it's not a lens, it's not a prism. It's not expressible in the, uh, the format we've got. Um, uh, so this, this universe of data accessors is not <coughs> under composition of data accessors. It's not a very good abstraction that I've shown you. So I'm going to show you a better one. And the, 
the, the trick is these things called profilters. So profilters are um, a generalization of functions. So they're things that consume stuff and produce other stuff. Uh, so the, uh, in Haskell, I capture that as a two-parameter type constructor P, and this two-parameter type constructor P, you can tell it's a two-parameter type constructor because it's a type and it's applied to two parameters. Uh, it's a profactor uh, if you can provide a function uh, called dimap um, with the following type. And what this says is, if you've got a box that consumes A's and produces B's, and you have a mechanism for turning A primes into A's, and another mechanism for turning B, B's into B primes, then you can just wire those together and make a bigger box that turns A primes into B primes. And it doesn't matter whether the box takes one A and produces one B, or takes one A and produces two B's, or takes an A and produces a B and boolean, or takes two A's and produces a B. Um, you can always just plug the A prime to A things on the front and the B to B prime things on the back and, uh, and adapt it. Um, the crucial thing is that it's uh, covariant in the output type, uh, but contravariant in the input type, so the, hence the, uh, the reversal of the arrow in the input type. Yeah. And of course, um, it's a generalization of functions, so functions are an instance of this uh, pattern. Um, a function H will consume A's and produce B's, it will take one A in and produce one B out, and if you can turn A primes into A's, and then turn A's into B's, and then B's into B primes, uh, you get turning A primes into B primes. Um, uh, so functions are a very simple instance of this pattern, but also um, uh, sort of enhanced functions, functions that turn an A not into a B, but into a pair of B's, a collection of B's, a B and a boolean, some other stuff, uh, that also fits the pattern. Um, and I'm not going to explain this Haskell program, but uh, this is how uh, functions of the form A to F of B for some collection type F uh, fit the pattern. Um, as it happens, functions of the form F A to B also fit the pattern, but I don't need that for this, uh, for this paper. I need two um, uh, refinements of that notion of profactor. So these refinements are uh, for transformer boxes that can act on things in various kinds of context. Uh, I need to be able to act in a product context, and I need to be able to act in a sum context. Uh, so this is quite technical, uh, so uh, just use, look, use the pictures to get an impression of what's going on. Um, if you've got a box that turns A's into B's, uh, and you have a C as well, then you'd like to be able to turn B's into uh, uh, AC collections into BC collections, and basically you just wire the, the C around the side. Um, and the profactor is set in Cartesian if you can do that, and there's a little widget that, uh, that does the wiring. <coughs> and dually, if you have a sum type, uh, so you either have a C or you have some A stuff, uh, you'd like to be able to turn that into either a C or some B stuff. Um, uh, so that the dash line down the middle is supposed to denote two different worlds. You either have um, C stuff or you have uh, A stuff. And uh, again, a profactor, a transformer that lets you do this is called co-Cartesian. It is formally dual to being Cartesian, and there's a little widget that does the wiring for you. So there are profactors which are transformers, and then there are various refinements on that idea: Cartesian and co-Cartesian profactors. Um, and then profactor optics. The representation is as it's a higher order representation. It's necessarily a higher order thing. Um, I'm going to represent my optics now as mapping between transformers. Um, so an optic with five type parameters is just a way of turning an, an AB transformer into an ST transformer. So here's a picture. Um, if I have an AB transformer, um, this is my optic box, and if I have an AB transformer, um, I can plug it into the box, and you can perhaps see from the picture, you might hope to get an ST transformer out of that. Uh, 
from the S, some A's come out, you turn them into B's, uh, and sit them back into the box, and then some G's come out. And so this is turning S's into T's. Um, the picture is just a picture, it's just supposed to give you some impression. Um, the, uh, the formal bit is this type declaration here, uh, type optic. Um, and what we're going to do is uh, use this representation for particular kinds of P. So we're going to start with P's necessarily being profunctors, but then we're going to talk about the refinements, Cartesian profunctors and Cartesian profunctors. But the crucial thing is that now an optic, something like a lens, is just a function. It's something, it's a function of type <coughs> PAB PST, but it's just a function. So two of these uh, optics are two functions, and what can you do with functions? You can compose them. Uh, the composition works very nicely, and I'll, I'll show you how that, how that comes out. So here's the, the simplest case, the adapters. I'm going to show you the simplest case, uh, and then assert that it works for the, uh, the, the more complicated cases in your paper. So this was the, the first line there, is the, the record type that I have for adapters. An adapter is just a pair of functions from and to. Um, my profunctor representation of adapters is as one of these optics. So it's something that turns a PAB into a PST, but it's allowed to assume that P is a profunctor type. Um, and these two types are entirely isomorphic, they're equivalent. There are translation functions that translate from one to the other and back again, and those two functions are each other's inverses. And that's a theorem that's proved in the paper, uh, well, stated in the paper and proved in the appendix of the paper. <coughs> These are the two conversion functions. Um, so let me briefly tell you what's going on here. If I have one of these concrete adapters, which is a, a pair of functions, from function and to function, here called O and I, um, uh, can I make a profunctor adapter? Can I make one of these optics. Well, that is to say, if I'm also given a PAB, can I make a PST? Um, well, you just plug the functions together. Um, you have a, an AB transformer, and you have a from function that uh, turns S's into A's, and you have a to function that turns B's into T's, and you plug them together, and that will turn your PAB into a PST. Great. Um, that's, that's quite straightforward. The opposite direction is where all the clever bits is. If I've got one of these profunctor adapters, can I make a concrete adapter? Uh, which is to say, if I've got a way of turning PABs into PSTs, how do I make one of these things? Well, the trick is, you start off with a trivial um, uh, concrete adapter, uh, a concrete adapter of uh, type AB, AB. That's a way of turning A's into A's, and then turning B's back into B's again. Uh, those are very easy to make because it's just a pair of identity functions. Um, and what this profunctor widget, L, will do is transform that P, A, B, A, B into a P, A, B, S, T. So it will transform my trivial adapter A, B, A, B into an adapter A, B, S, T, which is precisely what I need to do. Um, so I just make the trivial adapter have two identity functions and apply my profunctor thing to it. Um, and it's kind of surprising that that works. Uh, it's it's a, uh, an enigmatic um, little program, but it does precisely the right thing. I need to show that this concrete adapters themselves form a profunctor, and, and, but that's not difficult to do. So um, I encourage you to kind of meditate on that one liner because that's really the essence of what's going on. Um, uh, but I don't have time to meditate and then we'll talk after it. So. Um, so let me assert that uh, exactly the same trick works for lenses and for prisms and for traversals. We have the three concrete types, which are just records. Uh, we have the three profunctor representations of them, which are just these optic things. They're ways of turning PABs into PSTs for various kinds of P. For lenses, you can, you're allowed to assume that it's a, not just a profunctor, but a Cartesian profunctor. For prisms, you're allowed to assume that it's not just a profunctor, it's a co-Cartesian profunctor. And for traversals, you're allowed to assume both, two, both of those and another thing that I haven't told you about. Um, uh, uh, optic PABST is the same as this. Sorry, that's the typo uh, in which of the slide. 
So uh, you'll have to see the, the paper for the translation. It, it, it works out uh, beautifully sweetly. And then this is what you can do. <coughs> so remember we had uh, uh, a concrete lens for access onto the left hand component of the pen, called the pi 1. Um, now you can make a profunctor representation of that, a profunctor lens uh, that for access onto the left hand component of the pair. And we just apply our translator, the, the concrete to profunctor lens translator, lens CP, uh, to the concrete lens, and we'll get the profunctor lens. Um, if you expand out the definitions, then, then this is what you get. Um, uh, and uh, if you stare at that long enough, you can kind of figure out what's going on. Uh, it's, it's short, it's not difficult to write, but it's, um, it's not obvious. Um, uh, I, I would not have come up with this definition from first principles. It's the, uh, it's the profile and stuff that leads me there. Um, similarly, uh, we have this uh, a concrete prism for access onto an optional value, and we can make a profile of prism by applying the translation to that. And now these things compose so sweetly that it's, um, uh, it, it, well, it just blows my mind, really. Um, uh, we wanted access onto the left-hand component of the left-hand component of an nested pair. Well, uh, you've got an access onto the left-hand component, and there's access onto the left-hand component again, and you just compose them. They're just functions, functional composition is your frame. It just puts them together. Um, so for example, the square function applied to this nested pair 3, 4, 5 in this way um, squares the left-hand component to the left-hand component. It just does it. Similarly, uh, for the heterogeneous case, this pi in the profunctor representation gives me access to the left-hand component of the pair, the v in the profunctor representation gives me access to an optional value, um, put them together, and you get access onto the uh, left-hand value, left-hand component of an optional pair. And it's just function composition. So here's an optional pair, it's a present pair, uh, and if I want to square the left-hand components of it, uh, this is where to get the accessor to get the left-hand component. I can square the left-hand component and I get uh, my pair back again with the left-hand component squared. So uh, the, the, the payoff is so sweet that the pain of uh, the, the, the formal instructions is, is certainly worth going through. And um, that's, that's the story I wanted to tell you. Uh, the reason I wanted to tell you it um, uh, part, is partly because it's so sweet and I just want to talk about it, but also there's a, there's a message there. I've shown you some Haskell programs. In the paper there's also Scala programs that do the same thing, so it's not, a, not only a Haskell trick, but it's nearly only a Haskell trick because it depends on this feature of uh, generics, um, uh, parameterization by types where the generics have higher kind. So I'm not parameterizing by things like integer and character and boolean. <coughs> uh, I'm parameterizing by things like profunctor and applicative uh, and uh, other stuff like functor and monad and so on. Um, these are not types, but they're operations on types. So you need to be able to parameterize by these things in order to express the, uh, the constructions. So this is not just generic programming, something that I've talked about, uh, written about many times, called data type generic programming. So we, we might think of these things as data types, not types, uh, container types. And as far as I know, Haskell and Scala are the only two languages that provide parameterization by uh, types of higher kind, operations on types. Um, and this feature is necessary for certain kinds of modularity. Um, and I, I, I would like more languages to support this feature. So that's my, that's my uh, ulterior motive, if you like, for giving the talk. Um, and with that, I'm done. Um, to conclude, uh, there are these uh, optics, there are ways of accessing data, there's concrete representations of, as, in terms of just access to functions. They are not modular, they don't compose nicely. This clever higher order representation in terms of functors does. Um, it separates concerns, and that's always a good thing. It separates how to uh, get to a piece of data with what you're going to do to it. So we can say IP1 not IP1, that's, that's how to get to a piece of data, and separately uh, um, you're going to square that thing. So you might think of them as composable first-class references, uh, first-class composable references, uh, 
um, uh, done in a very sweet way. And I think my credits, it's, it's not just my idea, it's not, it's not even mainly my idea. Uh, there's lots of blog stuff out there by people like Ed Kmetz and uh, Russell O'Connor. Um, my co-authors and my funding, this is, this is actually Matthew Pickering's undergraduate project work. Uh, uh, so he's now gone on to do a PhD, going on to do a PhD with Nick. Um, but, but Matthew's very clever and uh, it's, it's his ideas mostly, which I've written about and talked about. So thank you very much. It looks very nice indeed. I'm just wondering what it means in practice for people writing programs. Um, so what, what you write, I suggest, is you write the obvious concrete thing, like pi, pi 1. Those are not difficult to write. Yeah. You don't try and write the uh, complicated thing, like pi P1. But you don't need to, because uh, you can just <coughs> convert the simple thing into the complicated thing. But then you've got to know where you put the conversions. Is that right? Is that where the design decision comes? Um, where? I'm not sure what you mean by where. Um, so you, you do have to say where you want to act. I want to act on the left hand component to the left hand component. You have to say that. That's mm -hmm. not going to be inferred by anything. Um, uh, in fact, um, Edward Kvet's libraries uh, use clever template metaprogramming um, to, to generate all these things. So there are obvious ways of accessing every component of a composite data structure. With a little bit of template Haskell, you can get those all generated for you. So uh, you, you, you you might not need to write any of this if you are happy to accept template Haskell or any other mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, and we've kind of short, but please continue to approach any questions that you have. Yeah, so I'll just take a quick question.